And I went, what are you doing here, Mum? And my mum went, come here, darling. And as I walked down, Terry went to me, Mickey's dead. And all of a sudden, all I could hear was somebody screaming. And somebody went, she's hysterical, slap her around the face. And I was thinking, yes, yeah, slap her around the face, who is screaming? But it was actually me. And that's the beginning of the nightmare. Do you know how long I've wanted to get you on this podcast? <laughs> no. <laughs> so hard to get through to you because I've got to go through all these PR people. You're a you're a um, um, is exclusive lady, difficult to track down. Well, I don't know why because I'm I'm actually very grounded and um, I'm not one of these elusive people. So. <laughs> I'm sorry if you've had a bad experience. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. You know what? Because I read your book, Black Widow, about uh, yes. three months ago. Because that's when I thought I was getting you on. But you know how it is. It's all right. PR people, isn't it? So you probably didn't even hear about it until the other day. No, I was only told the other day that um, that you were, have been waiting ages to do this podcast. <laughs> and I said, well, why has he been waiting ages? And they said, no, because... The paperback comes out this month, so it, it works for the paperback. Yeah. And I suppose they, they know what they're doing. But yeah. um, no, I, as I say, I'm, I'm not a hard person, to really. I didn't think I was a hard person to get a hold of. You're not. You're not. It's, you know, it's, it's their jobs, isn't it? I, I understand it. They've yeah. got to time these things, right? Of course. They, they do do it to say, well, this is coming out. That's when we do this, whatever. So... Um, yeah. Anyway, at long last. It's Here we nice are. To meet you. <laughs> yeah, I was lovely to meet you. How's your day going? Um, very quiet. I'm actually. Um, I've got a caravan that I come down to, and I know it's not very nice weather, but I came down a couple of days ago. And just thought I'd chill out down here till the weekend, and then go oh. back to the hustle and bustle. Oh, nice. Whereabouts are you? I'm in Essex. Okay, nice. Out in yeah. the countryside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what it's about. I've just moved down to Bristol. I was living in Berlin previously. By the way, it might cut out at some point. It's because my internet's really dodgy because I haven't I haven't got the new internet. Well, I've just moved house. So if it cuts out, right. you might be able to just stay where you are and in a minute or two, I'll come back into the conversation. Yeah, I'll do that. Don't worry. Okay, good, yeah. good. Um, yeah, so yeah, I was just saying I moved to Bristol and just a bit of countryside. It's nice to get away from the city sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, you, are you down? Is tell me if I'm right. Is the Forest of Dean down near you? Shall I look it up? Because I don't even know. Because I've just moved here. Forest of Dean. Oh, right. Yeah. So I'm look the reason I'm saying it is because I'm actually an exhibit in the museum. <laughs> You're kidding me. <laughs> and I think it's not that far from you. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a one or well, fifty minute drive, thirty miles. All right. But is is the exhibit worth it? Oh, well, but of course I'm going to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, I mean, the actual museum itself is well worth a visit. It's crime through time, and it's um, privately owned by a really great guy called, um, oh, God, this is naughty, Andy Jones. And uh, he has done a, it's he bought a prison and he turned it into a museum oh wow and i'm like he tells me i'm his favorite exhibit but i'm sure he probably says that to everybody. i believe him come on you're his favorite i bet <laughs> what, what does he show about you just your life story sort of thing um well i've got a cell that i'm put in um in my wedding dress and my husband's got his clothes on and there's different exhibits that I've given him, um, my radio that I had in prison, um, mm. lots of different bits of memorabilia and whatever. And as I say, I'm one of his exhibits, but his exhibits oh. are very, very rare, uh, varied. It is, worth a, it is worth a few. Yeah. How was it going on Ross Kemp, by the way? That's where I first saw you and he's great, isn't he? Oh, he's, he's so lovely and down to earth. Oh. And when we walked in, he said, would you like a coffee? And I said, oh, yeah, lovely. He went, right, <laughs> put, up, put the kettle on. I said, oh, you do it yourself then. He went, of course I do. I'm not pretentious. I went, oh, good. 
<laughs> no, but he was very, he was lovely, really nice. Oh, he looks like a sweet guy, actually. I wish I could put a pop a kettle on for you at the moment. I can't do it from here. <laughs> oh, no, no good, is it? Shame. No. Oh. So let's, let's, well, you know what? Do you want to tell me about, so this latest book, The Locksmith, because I, I, I haven't read The Locksmith because I read Black Widow. Um, right. But tell me a little bit about The Locksmith. How The Locksmith came about, um, my last husband that I met when I was on home leave um, unfortunately died four years ago. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. He had cancer. Yeah, it's sad because we were sort of really enjoying life, but these things happen, so, you know. But when he was dying, he said to me, Linda, write your life story. Everybody else has written about you. Write, you write. And I did. And I found I really, really enjoyed writing it. And I got the bug. <laughs> so then I thought, right, I've done my life story. You can only do your life story once. So I'm going to do fiction, but I'm going to do fiction on what I know. And what I know is crime. <laughs> <laughs> and I've probably met most of the criminals that everybody hears about um, and mixed in their circles. And sort of from shoplifters going up to the top of the tree of armed robbers etc and um i've met um, and friends with um freddie foreman that is well known as brown bread fred um when i was away reg proposed to me twice which i hmm. said to him i didn't think was a very good idea or we ne neither of us would have ever gone home um but I, it's something I know about. So yeah. it's fiction, but it's very true to life because it is based on my knowledge of that world and yeah. the people in that world. Um, so I, I did the, I did the synopsis and Martina Cole said to me, have you got an agent, darling? And I said, no. So she went, I'll get you a fantastic agent. And she got me this really fantastic guy, Kerm Cray. And he said, yes, I like the sound of this book. We'll go out and see what we can do. And Welbex believed in it and said, we love the concept. Let's go for it. So mm. the locksmith was born. And oh, it's, had, it's had fantastic reviews. Um most people say no oh, it's so real to life the characters come to life and that was my aim um and I've had people saying to me oh god they're so real that I even argue with them or, or saying no don't do that don't do that he said one of the guys was and he said I thought what are you doing this is a <laughs> this is a fiction book and you're saying no don't do that mate <laughs> <laughs> but I've also found um that as many of my readers are men as women. And oh, yeah. I think because that when the men read it, it actually rings true to them. And they, um, you know, it, it has really come across great. And I've just finished the sequel, which I've handed in, and that will be coming out next. Oh, March. you're prolific. Well, I could be more prolific, I suppose, if I didn't write with a pen and paper. <laughs> <laughs> you you write it all down on pen and paper, do you? Oh my god! I used to wonder how people ever did that, and I didn't. I couldn't believe people are still doing it because your wrist must just ache, and then having to change things around is just impossible. I mean, I do have a year to get it done, <laughs> but um, it's not it's not that bad. And it's funny because before I sort of started and got into it, Martina, who obviously is the queen, um, she said to me, "Look." I don't understand these people that go oh, on a Wednesday for three hours. I write because how do you know you're going to have any creative thoughts on a Wednesday in that three hours? And she said to me, if, if you want to do it right, if you wake up in the middle of the night and go, Oh God, that'd be good in my book, jump up and write it. She went, that's what I do. She went, and that's why my books have been a success. And wherever she is, she went, you don't have to set time. You, you just, things come to you. You might be cooking your dinner and think, oh, he could do that. Right. Turn the cooker off, write that bit, and then go back to it. Um, and that is the way that I do it. And 
it's it works. I mean, I couldn't just sit and write and write and write. But it eventually does end up as as a full book. Do you know what's what's fascinating from reading uh, Black Widow, your first book? Yes, was was how good the writing is, and I wonder. I was going to ask you if it's not rude to ask whether there was a ghost writer or something, or was that that's you? No, I I do have assistance. I mean, I virtually write the majority of it. I'm not the best, the world's best speller. Um, mm. And I'm not the world's best in knowing to put full stops and commas. And um, so I do have a, a person that does help me with it. Mm. And where I might put, oh, yes, he pulled up and he walked in and said, blah, blah, blah. She will put, he got out of his stadies. And so she helps me with, with that part. But she said to me, Linda, your books couldn't be written without you because you are you are the person who's done them. She just sort of tidies them up for me. Okay, yeah. I mean, it, it is, it's such a lovely read. Hang on, I've got to turn the radiator down. I'm boiling. I've put the radiator on. Yeah, right, I just turned mine down as well. <laughs> I'll just turn it off for a bit. It's ridiculous. It's like not even October and I've got it on, but... You know, it's off now. Yeah, I got um, up this morning and just yeah. before you came on, I thought, God, it's too hot. Let's turn this off. <laughs> you can't get hot doing these things, can't we? We'll be all sweaty. Um, <laughs> so my family were also, by the way, in the East End where you were growing up. That's The East End is almost a character in Black Widow. It's a, it's a, a you know, my family, it's a similar thing. And you yeah. were the second of nine children. I think my grandfather was the joint last of, of 13 children yeah. out in the East yeah. End. And you mentioned in, in the book that there is mention of Jack the Ripper and the Cray twins. Was it just a world away from anywhere today? Is there anything like that today? Or is it just a different world? Uh- I don't know. I I just think there is something about the East End and the Cockneys. And people have always had a fascination, I think, for that world. And as you say, sort of going back in time, there was Jack the Ripper and there was the Elephant Man in the London Hospital. And there was all these characters that sort of fascinated people through time. And then, of course, coming nearer, then we've had the Cray Twins, etc. And I think the East End sort of become a bit mythical, really. And Cockneys actually are sort of a breed of their own. And it, when you meet a Cockney, I mean, I don't know so much now, but when we were growing up, I mean, nobody had a lot, but everybody was staunch royalist. I mean, you, you sort of could be really hard up the pole, but you still oh no we've got a queen and we've got and everybody was proud of being a royalist and I think there's sort of that little quirky bits about the East End that Hmm. you know and that people did it it is a cliche but people did stick together and um, people did leave their doors open for people and everybody had an auntie and an uncle because you called all the neighbours auntie this and uncle that they obviously weren't, but it was a very close community. And, I mean, my, my dad was a blacksmith and he used to do a lot of work in the markets, um, down the meat market and the fruit and veg. And he often used to say, well, can you pay me in food? And that, this was at a time when people, a lot of kids had bread and jam for tea. And we used to eat such good food. And... One of the places that my dad used to go was in um, the tea factory. And we always had a big tea chest under the stairs full of tea. And my mum used to, as soon as she got a new one, would put it all in different bags and say, go and take that to Auntie so So take that <laughs> to Auntie. And all the neighbours got bags of loose leaf tea because there wasn't tea bags then. Um, and that's sort of the things that people did do. And what about the Cockney rhyming slang? Was that was that a real? Because to me, it's just this magical world that never, uh, apart from apples and stairs, it's uh, apples and pears. Sorry for <laughs> stairs. That's the only one that sort of stayed alive. That one. Well, I mean, my dad always he'd go, "Oh, get me Daisy Roots." Daisy Roots. Yeah, boots. <laughs> <laughs> what about Barney? Is it Barney Rubble Trouble? Barney Fair was hair. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't a shortcut. It was. I think when it, Cockneys spoke to each other, sort of people that weren't 
familiar, sort of lost track of what they were talking about. And I think maybe that was what the point of it was many years ago. And you do still hear it, but unfortunately you don't hear it like you did all those years ago because a lot of the Cockneys have moved away from East London and like everything, things change. But you do still hear it if you sort of go down there and you're like more so the sort of the old people, the old boys and the old girls that still be saying the the different things. When your mother wanted to sort of get rid of you kids and stuff for a bit, she'd go and tell you to go and play on the bomb sites. I know. <laughs> My grandchildren go, no, no, could your mother, I, I could nanny tell you to go and play on the bomb site. All because the East End was was heavily bombed, really heavily bombed because of the docks, etc. And all the kids were told, go and play on the bomb site. There were no parks, there was nothing else. And it was normal. And oh like the kids would knock and say, I'm going down so and so street. All the houses were bombed and go, Yeah, all right, I'll tell them, come down to you. And it was like the norm. Like go and play on the bomb sites. I mean, when you think now, how scary to even, even if there was no bombs, just tell your kids to go and play in bombed buildings. And you did, though. And we all did, and we all survived it. (laughs) (laughs) Bloody hell. So it's just a totally different upbringing. I like that as the beginning of the book and of this podcast episode, because it does give a sort of a different view of how you grew up and, and, and what maybe, I mean, how did you get into sort of the crime world? Well, although crime was rife in the East End, it, it always has been forever, um, I actually wasn't aware of crime and criminals until I met my then-to-be first husband. And I met him. They, there was a party for him. He was, um, he'd was he been in prison and he'd come home and there was a party and I was invited um, and I met him and sort of looked at him and thought, oh, wow, he's nice. And he looked at me and thought, of course, she's nice. And that was it. We clicked. And when I said to my mum, oh, I've met this guy, and she said, oh, what does he do? I said, well, nothing at the moment. He's an armed robber. And my dad went, for F's sake, what's wrong with her? <laughs> <laughs> and... I mean, the rest is history, as they say. You were, you were quite open then about him being an armed robber. Well, yes. I mean, mm. I wouldn't sort of lie to my parents. <laughs> and no. when I met him, my mum went, oh, no. And my dad went, oh, what's wrong with her? <laughs> so <laughs> I said, oh, Dad, so lovely. I mean, he was very charismatic. Sure. And when he met my my parents and my brothers and sisters, they all really, really liked him. Um, But obviously that they weren't happy that he was a career criminal. It wasn't exactly what my mum and dad wanted for their kids. No, no. It it still (laughs) seems like quite an understated reaction, doesn't it? I feel like nowadays, if you said, you know, if one of your grandchildren said, I'm going out with an armed robber now, you you might hit the roof. I'd go, no, don't do it, for God's sake. (laughs) rather than oh no she hasn't done that has she oh no she's gone and an armed robber i mean when i think back they were sort of so laid back my mum and my dad were laid back about everything really um <laughs> they really were <laughs> but loving it was like, oh for god's sake but my my parents were so loving and kind yeah. we had the best we had the best parents ever and if anyone said, look, if you could go back in time and you could have lived with a really rich family and had everything, none of us would have accepted that. We'd have all gone, no, we'll have our mum and dad to grow back up in the East End. Because yeah. our mum and dad were, were so nice. They oh, were lovely people. That's lovely. Well, that's how it should be. Mm-hmm. So this was Mickey, yeah. wasn't it? And so so yes. Mickey was doing the arm and he'd turn up at your house with you know bags of money after a raid. You must have been scared out of your wits every time he went off I was but I think I don't know I, I mean I was only 19 when I met him and actually very naive mm. and I think it's he sort of just mesmerized me that there was this man that sort of went out and came back and went hey Al, I'm going to take you out buy you this buy you that and I just think oh this is good and I never looked beyond it to 
to be honest, I know it's a stupid thing to say. And looking back now, I think, bloody hell, what a stupid person you actually were no. to just not look past what I did look at, you know? Well, you were young, weren't you? I was young, and he was, I mean, he was, yeah, okay, he, he was what he was, but he was a very family orientated person and he absolutely loved his kids and he loved me um and he was a proper family man and really got involved with the kids and whatever and in fact we probably were ahead of our time because I went to work and he was a stay-at-home husband unless he was (laughs) gonna go and do anything and it was him that used to take the kids to school and do the housework and Oh. So the kids, yeah, it was sort of, which is quite the norm nowadays. You get a lot of husbands that stay at home and, and wives, if they've got a better job, go out. But we were sort of the odd couple at that time, I suppose, but it did work for us. Yeah. Very few of those stay-at-home dads are armed robbers today, though. No, I don't suppose many of them are. <laughs> Must be some, though. Although it's a dying art. I don't think you could do an armed robbery anymore. I mean, oh, oh. The, in those days, there were no CCT cameras, and it was a lot different. I think yeah. it was, like we say of like the Cockneys, it's a bygone time, and that time has gone, and it will never return. That sounds like a challenge, Linda. <laughs> Should we hatch a plan? Really? I mean, <laughs> I mean, some of the outdacious things that w- was done, you could just never do now. They go, oh, we're going to rob there. But how, how can we be in the street? Oh, let's put a temporary bus stop up. <laughs> and you sort of walk along the night before and put a temporary bus stop and there'd be people queuing up going, when's the bus coming? It's <laughs> <laughs> incredible. So, I mean, it sounds a bit Keystone Pops, but it used to work. But what was the reason for the fake bus stop? What's that going to do for the bank? Well, no, so you could stand at the bus stop and wait for the security van to arrive and not arouse suspicion. Why were you standing there? Okay. So, (laughs) but I mean, that's sort of just a a one-off example, but there were so many that they sort of, we had a garage full of props that, oh yeah, we use that for that or this for this. And it, People at that time, they, it was prolific for arm robbers. I mean, people we sort of turned up at a thing and thought, oh, God, they're going to do this as well. And it'd be like, well, you having it or are we having it? And it's <laughs> they sort were of... kidding me. Everyone's just, <laughs> we, we, we got here first, we'll do the arm robbery today. No, I mean, that's, that, in fact, it, that had happened to us a oh. couple of times. And it was like, no, go well, on, you have it. And, and we go. <laughs> and, and it was, it's, it is, you could not have this that life again. It, it, no. it was a time that was of its time. And it, it's, it's gone now. You would know, I mean, probably most people go with just as well. But it was of its time. I mean, I don't know if you ever watched Life on Mars or The Sweeney. Mm. No, I've seen some of the movies, Ocean's Eleven or that. They were so, I mean, even a lot of the, the uh, sort of, flying squad and whatever were as crooked as as the crooks mm. and every every sort of crook worth his soul had a crooked policeman who'd go don't do that they're watching it <laughs> so <sighs> it was it really was a, a very different time and i don't think anybody nowadays would go i just can't imagine it but it actually that is how it was wow and you had your red hair and glasses on, didn't you? I used to put different wigs on, all different wigs. Um, yes, always hmm. had different guises. My grandfather used to make wigs, so you probably kept him in business at that time. <laughs> well, my mum um, worked for a wig maker as well. My mum actually sold wigs, hmm. which was handy. <laughs> I wonder if he, they knew each other. You ever heard of a Stanley Goldstein? Jewish family. Yeah. Yes. You knew Stanley Goldstein. From the Stan- yeah. Was there Ron- Ronald and Stanley? He he had a partner. He did. I don't remember. Was it Ronald? It might have been. I'd have to ask my dad. But if it was Ronald and Stanley, that's who my mum worked for, Eileen Welford. 
I know because they couldn't have been. <laughs> my grandpa couldn't have been older than your mum. I don't. Th- oh, oh. No, he was younger than my mum. He was young, oh. a lot younger than my mum. Well, that could be him, you know. Yeah, he's, he was he's passed a away lot now. Younger than my mum. Wow. Um, but it was Ronald and Stanley. And yeah. what did you say? His surname Ginsberg. Goldstein. Goldstein. Yeah, it could well have been. It could well have been. My mum worked for Wigmakers in the East End and it was Ronald and Stanley and they were a lot younger than my mum. They were younger than me, I think. No, no, then that wouldn't be him. Because he was was 90 when he died and that was about five, six years ago. Oh. I don't know. It could be. be. I'm going to ask my dad if it was Ronald. Otherwise, it's it's another Stanley with wigs at that time. Yeah, but I mean, I think there was quite a few people in the East End at that time that were doing wigs. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, well. there was Stanley of Paris that used to do wigs, that my mum made wigs for him as well. Um, but it was quite, I mean, my mum loved that time and she yeah. used to sell wigs as well. Yeah, yeah, it was a big thing, the wigs, wasn't it? Not so much anymore, I suppose. No, I mean, it really was. People, everybody wanted these sort of outlandish hairstyles and whatever, and you could just go and buy a wig and pop it on and go out and you... I mean, a lot of the women would buy them because they'd think, but I'd like blonde hair, but I haven't got it. So they'd buy a blonde short wig and then they'd sort of take it off and have their their sort of dark, different hair. But um, no, that's funny. Maybe it is. Mm, still big in the Orthodox Jewish community. They got to wear they wear wigs. I, think. I know. Yes, yes. They love the it. ladies wear them, don't they? And they then do. when they're married, yeah. What was so? So Mickey then got arrested. Is that right? And then you did you marry him? Because I've read this now three months ago. But you got married in prison. Yes, he was in um, Wandsworth Prison when mm. I married him. What was that like? Well, it wasn't the wedding that I grew up to expect. It was my mum and dad and me and my daughter, Melanie, in my dad's old van going to Wandsworth Registry Office. And they'd rerouted the traffic for the day because somebody had said, oh, it's an escape plot, which was ridiculous because he was only doing a couple of years. But you always get stupidness. Um so all the police were there waiting and it was no you can't kiss the bride and you can't have your handcuffs off and sort of follow us back and you can have sort of 20 minutes in the prison for a visit and my dad went well this isn't what I expected for my first daughter's wedding I'm really disappointed um about Kesara yeah they put a bag on his head didn't they they tried to and he said to him, I'm not, he said, listen, you're not doing that to me. You're not putting a bag over my head. Ridiculous. Yeah, really weird. But you loved him, you know? So I did love him. And I've got my two beautiful children, Melanie and Neil. And I've sort of been asked, if you could go back in time, how far back would you go? Well, I would never go back past having my children. No. So I guess my life would have been... As it was, because I, wouldn't I would it. not, I wouldn't change it. Because if I went back past Mickey, I wouldn't have had them, and I wouldn't have had my grandchildren. And so, I mean, not that any of us can go back and change. We can't change yesterday, let alone a lifetime ago. I suppose one one part you might want might change was was the tragic moment of of the book um, when the police killed Mickey. Was yeah. Is that still hard to talk about now? Well, I still believe, I mean, it it was terrible. And I'm not going to justify what they were doing because you can't justify people doing robberies. But he had nothing in his gun. Um, The night before, he'd got his cartridges and he'd taken all the pellets and everything out and he put cotton wool in and just sealed the top back up. And I said, why are you doing that? He said, because I couldn't hurt anybody. He said, and this is the outside a the supermarket. There's going to be women and children. I could not ever fire a gun with anything in it. He said, but if I if I had to sort of hold my gun up in the air and just pull the trigger, all that would come out, it would make the noise, but there would be fluff coming out. There wouldn't be anything that could hurt anybody. And so knowing that, when he died the next day 
and the police said, oh, he faced, he faced the policeman and said, it's me or you. Well, no sane person would face somebody with a, with a loaded gun and knowing you've got nothing in yours and say, it's me or you. So I yeah. knew. And I said, he was shot in the back. And they went, no, he wasn't. I said, yes, he was. And I said, we'll have our own autopsy. And they said, we've already done it immediately, which was very suspicious. And I said, no, I want my own autopsy. And they lost the body. And we had to go to court to get the body back. So there was a lot of lot of things that, a hell of a lot of things that weren't right. And we were told by a high-ranking officer that the um, policeman who shot him was actually off duty. Um, the gun, he should have taken the gun back. It was out illegally because he was off duty and he was drunk. Oh. And I was told ask for this, ask for this, ask for this, and you will prove it. But I can't, you cannot name me as the person who's telling you, but it's wrong. He said, if he, he, he was on his own, it wasn't, they did this sort of story afterwards. Oh, it was, um, the police were in waiting. Um, it wasn't true. He was on his own. Wow. He, he, and, um, he was there on his own for ages and he ha he actually had his foot on Mickey and they somebody said, oh, call an ambulance and whatever. He said, no, nothing being called till the police are here. I mean, it, there's so many witnesses because it was a Saturday outside a supermarket and a lady ran over who was a nurse and she said, I'm a nurse, I want to help him. And he went, stay away. And Mickey said to her, because she said this when in the um, court, that he said, Mickey said to her, don't get involved with these people. Thank you for offering to help me. And then he died drowning in his own blood. So, Jesus. Yeah, it was very traumatic. And I was told to ask for the gun book, which um, somebody had conveniently spilled a cup of tea on so you couldn't read it. It was illegible. Um, I was asked for the roster, which all oh, that week's rosters had gone astray. Uh, it was so, I mean, th there was so much in it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I still believe to this day that what happened to me later on was because I pursued that and I felt I had to pursue it because it yeah. wasn't right to say that he did that when he didn't. It's a very different story, but there are echoes of the Sarah Everard story at the moment, which was a drunk policeman who was off duty, exactly. who who took the law into their own hands. Of course, very different because what, what he did to Sarah Everard, yes. you know. Oh, God, horrendous. No, awful. But uh, uh, abuse of power, and you've, you've probably, I presume, never, you know, you were angry for many, many years after that. Yeah, yeah. I think it actually totally changed my outlook on on life and the world you know mm. um i was so bitter that this had happened to him and i sort of i became him if that makes sense and i started doing what he did until i actually got caught and when i did get caught it was like oh my god what have i done and i'd i was arrested i got seven years in prison and i deserve that seven years because of what i did and i thought how on earth have i done this and i think it was not post-traumatic stress i'm not going to say but there was something that affected me mentally to the point that it totally changed my personality yeah and after that i thought oh my god and I did. Nobody wants to go to prison. Prison's not nice. But I thought, no, I, I deserve to be here and I've got to atone for it. And I did. Um, but then I got fitted up by the police and I got a life sentence for a crime that I never committed. Mm. Well, we should get to the beginning of that because the, as you say, that was the big, that was the moment, I suppose, when the love of your life was shot in the back 
Um, although you don't, you know, apologize for what he was doing at the time, which was robbing banks no. with what looked like a gun. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 still a, a horrific moment for you. And I believe I remember that you were you your friends didn't want you to know, uh, so it sort of took you around to various bars in the night. Um. Well, what happened? We were going out with friends of his, and it wasn't in the days when there was mobile phones, etc. Um. And I thought, well, where is he? We're going out. And his friend turned up with his girlfriend, a new girlfriend that was actually a school teacher and didn't know what he did. And he said to me, where's Mick? And I said, he's not back yet. So he said, oh, you know what? He said, he's probably got the money and he's having a drink. And I said, but he knew we were going out with you. I, I don't think he would have done that. And he said... No, he must have done. He said they probably all went, come on, let's go and have a, a drink. He said, and he's got involved. So I thought it was strange that he wouldn't have come home. But um, I said, okay. And we sort of went down looking in different pubs and the, the locals that we went in. And people, no, he's not been in, sorry. And then we went in one pub and the governor said, oh, no, he's not been in. And his wife walked downstairs and went, oh, hello, darling. Mickey's just phoned, which wasn't true, obviously. So I said, I see. So she said, yeah. She said, um, he said, stay here and he'll be coming to this pub. And I went, well, that's really bad. I said, because we're going out. We're going out with these. There's so, such bad manners. And she went, no, no, no. He said he got held up, but he will be here. And then she walked over and whispered to her husband and he looked at me and then she called the man that I was with over and I was left standing with the girlfriend and they all looked at me. Well, apparently she had just seen the news where it had said a man had been shot dead in Elton and she knew that Mickey was doing something that day. So when we walked in and said, we're looking for Mickey, she just, she said, she just knew. So she made out and she said, I thought, I don't want you just carrying on going to, from pub to pub to pub. And so we stayed in the pub. And at the end of the night, when they called time, she said to me, oh, he's not turned up, but I'll come home with you. So I said, well, no, you can't because Sunday is your busiest day. No, don't worry. She said, I'll come home with you. I mean, I thought it was so lovely of her when I looked back. And the other couple went home and she came home with me. And six o'clock in the morning, the phone rang and it was Mickey's brother. And he said to me, Lynn, can you come round? Mickey's been nicked. And I went, oh, my God. So he went, I said, OK, I'll be. He said, no, come now. You must come now. And then Nick, for American listeners, Nick, Nick be, being he, he was arrested. They told you he'd been arrested. Yeah, yeah mm. he'd been taken to the police station. So I still never knew at that time. But everybody else did know. And when his brother said, no, you must come now, it ended up that the police had come to my house. I wasn't in. They'd then gone to the next address for him, which was his mother's. His mother was deaf and didn't, she was in bed and didn't hear the police. And so the next address was his brother. And they went to his brother's and said to his brother, your brother got shot today, blah, blah, blah. Can you find Linda and tell her? Because there's nobody at home. And he said, I will tell her, but I, I will have to, get her on the phone but I'm not going to phone her till the morning I'm not I'll let her have a night's sleep but he said by the time it got to six in the morning he thought I can't I can't wait any longer I've got to phone and he didn't want to say to me over the phone Mickey was dead so he said oh Mickey's been arrested but you must come now so I said oh I'll just get his clothes together he went no 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 leave his clothes you don't need his clothes and when we, um, the lady called a cab and we went to his house 
And as we walked in the door, I went, oh, God, what's happened then? And as I said, oh, God, what happened? I've looked. And looking out of his front room was my mum and his brothers and sisters. And I went, what are you doing here, mum? And my mum went, come here, darling. And as I walked down, Terry went to me, Mickey's dead. And all of a sudden, all I could hear was somebody screaming. And somebody went, she's hysterical, slap her around the face. And I was thinking, yes, yeah, slap her around the face, who is screaming? But it was actually me. And that was the beginning of the nightmare. My God. Yeah. What, I mean, you, your world must have just felt like it ended. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Is it, is it painful to talk about now? Um, well, I do talk about it. I mean, it still affects my my children to this day yeah and i think probably more my son even than my daughter because he goes mum i can never justify the way my dad died i can't justify it i can't accept that i lost my mm. dad i could have justified if my dad got arrested and got put in prison he said but i would have got my dad back he went mum i can't justify that, that that's what happened to my dad and it and then, does still affect, affect my children now. And then things got really quite scary uh, at, at the funeral in, in the form of Mickey's boss, Ronnie. He was a, a really menacing character in, in the book. Yeah. Tell me about Ronnie. Ronnie um, was, it came to light afterwards, was driving the car that Mickey and was on the robbery with Mickey, but nobody knew it. And um, when Mickey went to get in the car, he locked him out. So he, I feel, was as responsible for his death as the policeman. Hmm. And the reason being, afterwards, it came out a long time afterwards, that he said that when he came to my house to see Mickey, and it was the first time he saw me, he said... I hope you opened the door and I fell in love with you. It's like my life is the weirdest, weirdest stories ever. It's yeah, horrific what he did—a real a, a Shakespearean betrayal. And and then he pursued yeah. you and became quite aggressive. Well, he sort of in the beginning he was he came out and he said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Look, it's it's coming up to Christmas. It must be so hard for you." Um, here's money for your children, here's money for you. Um, and he was sort of everywhere I went, he was there. Um, and in the end, I was thinking, oh, he's such a kind man, he's so nice. But actually he wasn't. And I was then trapped. And he said to me, oh, that's it, you're mine now. And you don't want to be with me. You love your son. And I thought he was threatening my son. So I was stuck in in sort of catch-22. And it was actually his best friend, Brian Thorogood, who he asked to look after me. And Brian and I never liked each other. When Ronnie was in prison, he, he got arrested yeah. a bit later. Yeah. 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 And he went, oh, well, I've got to look after her. I don't even like her. And he said, that's the reason because you don't like her, I want you to look after her. But we actually, we ended up together. And I didn't know. Then when he went to prison, he then met Danny Reese, who I never knew, and told him the story and said, I'm so worried that some, her son will get killed. And Danny's son had been killed, but in a, he was run over and killed. And so he, he said he knew the loss of a child and said to Brian, don't worry, Brian, if I go home before you, I will kill him so he can't hurt her son. But this was all that I never knew. And this is what happened. And I wasn't aware of this murder until it actually happened. And the police treated me as I was a witness to the murder. 
and they eliminated me on that day from committing the murder. They did forensic tests on me. Um, they swabbed my hands and face. I had to blow into a hanky, and one of the policemen said, I've got a hanky she can have. And they came back and said, no, she's, she's eliminated. It's, we, we know she didn't do it. And then the next day, the head of the murder squad knocked at my house and said, why didn't you tell us you were Linda Calvey? And I said, I did. I wrote it on my statement. He said, well, you're now our suspect. We're charging you with the murder. Because of your past? Yeah. I said, but you eliminated me yesterday. He said, did we? How did we do that then? Oh. I said, well, there was about 10 policemen there when you did it. He went, none of them can remember. We're charging oh. you with a murder. Oh, my word. I've had a very, I've had a very, very strange life. Yeah, tell me about it. And the, the actual murder itself. So you were there and this guy, Danny. It was in my kitchen. So, oh. And we just walked into my house. And as we walked in, the loudest bang was my street door being kicked open. Mm. And I didn't know who it was. There was this big man came in with um, a hat on, pulled down, and a black jumper or something pulled right up so I could just see eyes. And he, he said in an Irish accent, get down on, please. And I was like, and Ron looked at him and went, what's up, mate? And with that, he fired at him. He said, get down, armed armed police? Yeah, get down, armed police. Okay. And, and Ron just looked at him and went, what's up, mate? And as he said that, the gun was fired. And I thought he'd been shot in the stomach, but he'd actually been hit in the arm. But the blood was running through his jacket. So to me, it looked like he'd been shot in the front. And I didn't know who this was. So I screamed and bent down in the corner. And then there was a second shot and this awful noise. And I thought, I'm going to be shot. And as I turned my head, he pulled his thing down and went to me, you'll be okay, and ran out. Huh. And I thought... I was like in total shock. And he did it to get to get you out of this abusive relationship where the guy to running save, Yeah, and save and save my son. Save your son, because he was threatening your son if you ever left him. He said to, he said to um Brian and Brian never ever told me, he said to Brian, I'm gonna kill her son when I go home. I'm yeah. gonna kill her son. And he said the thing was, Linda, Ron has killed a lot of people. He said it wasn't an idle threat. He said, and I said to Danny, who I'd never even met, he's going to kill our son. He's going to kill oh our son. God. And he, oh, my God. I mean, my life, they say life, truth is stranger than fiction, and my life actually is stranger than any fiction. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, that's what makes it such an engrossing book, the book of your life. And yeah. I mean, because we haven't even got on to the fact that then you were arrested, obviously. See, what does it feel like for you? Because when you go on your Wikipedia, it says murderer, Linda Calvey, and it says that you paid um, uh, Danny exactly. £10,000 to do yeah. it. Yeah, and in the call, um, my QC said, you say that she paid him £10,000. Where's your evidence? You... Yeah. you um, checked her bank accounts, was £10,000 taken out of her bank? He said, no. He said, you've checked him and his accounts. Did he have any money in his account? No. Well, where did you get this figure that she gave him £10,000? Oh, well, it's the going rate for a murder. And he went, mm. it's the going rate for a murder. He said, this lady is standing on trial for her life and you're pulled out of the air with no evidence to substantiate it, she gave him £10,000 to commit a murder. They put you away for that. I got 18 years. Well, I've got, actually, I've got seven. But, and the judge put his hands out and said, I'm sorry, all I can do is refer you to the full court of appeal um, and give you seven years, which I was charged with gangland murder, which should have started at a 20-year tariff. 
he said seven years. So in legal circles, he was saying, I'm not happy with this. Um, and I, I was referred to the full court of appeal and that has never happened since. And it only ever happened once before in written huh. legal history. And because I wouldn't say I committed the crime, I would never say I committed a crime, I didn't do it. Um, I ended up serving 18 years instead of seven. Oh, that's a long time just for your your principal, you know? Just, just, yeah. But I wow. would never say, I mean, when I went to prison the first time, I said I did it. I did it, I deserve to be here. This time I said I cannot ever say I committed this crime, I never did it. Yeah. And there's no reason not to be honest now, is there? No, it's done. not at all. I've, I've served, in fact, I've actually just um, done a program called The Hidden Truth, which when that comes out, um, well, I can't say the outcome, but I'm happy with the outcome. Hmm. What's that, The Hidden Truth? Um, it's, a, it's a new thing that James English has done. Oh, yeah. Um, He's invited six people that have said they were victims of injustice to go on a program and uh, go on a lie detector, etc. Ah. Well, okay, that's interesting. The lie detectors, though, are not they're not that accurate. So if you feel a bit nervous on that day, oh no, I mean the, this one apparently is because I always thought lie detectors they stuck stickers on you and all whatever. It, it isn't the ones they do now are in your eyes hmm. and it's um it is a computer that look it goes yeah. into your eyes yeah. and i don't know but apparently it's 99.9 percent .9 accurate this hmm. latest technology oh, i don't believe that that's what jeremy kyle was saying you know the do you know jeremy kyle yeah 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 that, well i don't know i just i hope it doesn't come up with the wrong thing but uh, well, he's good. Yeah, he's good. James English. He's he's um good. Yeah. Uh, got good podcast. Yeah. So oh. I I was very happy to go forward to do that. Oh, nice. My dad's messaged me by the way. So my grandpa's wig place was called. He had a salon called Charmaine. He had four shops in the East End. Ah. Oh. And his partner was was Raymond Grabina or and Peter Mann. No, my mum possibly would have known them, but um, yeah. no. It was, yeah. Um, yeah. I bet. I bet I'm sure they'd all known each other. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Because it was quite a small world, the wig world. I bet. Yeah. Anyway, so you went to prison. And this is this is one of the most, you know, as if your story is not extraordinary enough, the names that you met, in addition to Elton John, uh, were Myra Hindley. Yeah. <laughs> the Elton John bit was very brief. He wasn't in in prison with you in the in the. Womb. No, he wasn't in prison. He came he, as you know. He he does his age charity, um, yeah. and there were women in Holloway Prison that had AIDS, and it was when it was very very first had come to light, and it was sort of like everybody was like, Shh, "Don't go near these people. They could kill you. They're disease." Um, and there was a guy that started a, a charity for men and women in prison, and he brought Elton John into Holloway. And at that time, I used to take meals down and extra goodies for the people that were sort of locked in on their own because of AIDS. And he was sort of told about me, say, so I'd like to meet her, and he came up and... Um, all the girls walking through were going, oh, don't that geezer look like Elton John? <laughs> <laughs> he was going, I am. And they're going, no, you're not. Oh, that's <laughs> so funny. Because he had sort of a normal shirt and jeans on. And I think everybody just thinks they're going to see him walking about with diamonds and God knows what. Yeah. But um, no, he, he was really nice. And I actually wrote to him afterwards and said, can you help him out? Um, I know his charity is running on a shoestring and Barry who was running the charity come in and said you wrote to Elton he sent me £5,000 so oh. yeah that's nice that's nice and then very different to Elton was Myra Hindley who, who oh God, again horrendous woman yeah Americans again might not know but most people in Britain do know of Myra Hindley what 
Could you talk, yeah. say who? Explain who she is. Well, she's the Mars murderess. Um, mm. Along with her partner Ian Brady, they abducted and murdered children and tortured them. She was an awful mm. woman. Yeah, and you you were around her in like several different places. You really got to know her a bit, right? Well, over the years, um, mm. the first place I ever met her was in Cook and Wood. And I'd just been moved to Cook and Wood. This was when I did my first sentence. Hmm. And I arrived and they said, all right, we've already allocated you a job. You're starting in the laundry and, uh, in the library tomorrow. So I said, oh, okay. So they said, if you've got any washing, take it with you and you can get it washed. It's your next door to the laundry. And I started in the library that day and they came in and said to me, oh, you can take your washing in now while all the girls are in the factory. And they said, it's Myra that does the washing. Well, there was all this tape across, do not cross this line, etc. cetera. Um, and I stepped in and she was pulling washing out of the washing machine and she was singing, the radio was on. And I sort of just saw red and thought, how dare you sing when you murdered those children? And sort of, I just walked straight over and went slap. And she stood up and she rubbed her face and there was this big hand mark. And she went, I could get you sent back to Holloway for that. And I went, Holloway holds no fear for me. And I just walked back into the library and oh I thought, God. oh God, I'm going to get sent back to Holloway. <laughs> but she obviously didn't say anything. Except the next day, um, one of the officers come in and when Myra has her coffee in here, a uh, break at 11 and she comes in and she reads the paper and she has her coffee. Have you got a problem with that? And I said, no, I haven't. I can't have a problem with it if that's what she does. So they went, okay, fair enough. So whether she'd said to this officer, we had a little altercation, but that was it. So that was the very first time I ever saw her. Yeah, but by the end, she was asking you to kill a spider for her. That was many years later. Hmm. That was just before she died. Right. And um, I had, since that, after that, I had trained as a hairdresser in another prison. And I was um, used to do the hair. And the last prison she was in, she was sort of locked in a little no man's land because they, just couldn't let her out. And there was, um, the hairdresser used to go over if she had time and would cut her hair, but never had time to, to dye her hair, etc. And they came to me and said, look, she knows you're in this prison and somebody has got to dye her hair. She cannot do it. So I said, Jeremy, what? And they went, well, the governor would like you to do it. And I said, but I don't want to do it. And they said, well, you are waiting to go to open prison, Linda. It's not going to go down well if you say no. <laughs> so in other words, it was go and do her hair or, and stay, or stay here. So no. I was sort of putting another catch-22 where, okay, I had to go and do her hair. It's funny that presumably a psychopath, uh, we have to presume, I guess, that Myra Hindley was a psychopath yeah. and who didn't have any emotion. Mm. And she's still concerned in, in the prison about her looks. Yeah, and yet she was in solitary confinement. And then Rose West bumps in, put, walks in one day, who's a serial killer who uh, tortured and murdered nine young women, and she they yeah. became buddies. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they did. That was Just... prior to this. That was the second time I, oh. I saw Myra. What a pair. Well, yeah, exactly. And then Rose was on remand and she came in and they become very, very close. And as quick as they become really close, then they sort of distance themselves. Um, but both thoroughly obnoxious, awful people. I bet, I bet. And then the other big name, just because we're running out of time a bit, and I want to just get the other big name was Charles Bronson, I think. Yes. I used but, to get marriage proposals from Charles Bronson every three months. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. Yeah. For anyone again who doesn't know Charles Bronson, there was a good there was a film called Bronson, wasn't wasn't there? That was a good film. Yes. Yeah. Did you watch that? I did. Um 
I didn't particularly like it, to be honest. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I must admit, Tom Hardy really looked like him. Yeah. And Tom Hardy yeah. played him well, but I didn't particularly like the film. Mm. Well, fair enough. Mm. An eccentric character, I suppose. Yeah. Charles, yeah. Charles Bronson. He was. Mm. Well, it's been quite a, an amazing life. Um, and I hope people, a life so far, that is. I hope that people um, get both of your, blo- your books. Um, do you want to just give them a shout out now? Right. Well, it's um, The Black Widow by Linda Calvey. And my first novel, and I am so proud of it, The Locksmith. And it is out in paperback this month. Um, and I've just handed in the sequel. So please read it and I hope you enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed writing it. That was a trip down a memory lane for which I had no personal memory. I don't know if that makes much sense, but what I mean is I could almost touch and taste and smell the sights and sounds of 20th century East London in some of Linda's descriptions. Her life, activities, crimes and encounters are even more vivid in her book Black Widow, and she's used them to influence her acclaimed first fiction work, The Locksmith all in the show notes. We continue chatting in a short bonus episode available on patreon.com slash andrewgold or by joining this podcast on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. So do sign up as it supports the pod and should provide you with hours more material from the interviews. No new reviews or patrons this week. There have been a few new subscribers on Apple. I don't get your names there, but thank you all the same for your support as I now have 101 paying members across different platforms. And that's one step closer to making a living from this. Thank you all for continuing to listen and for getting in touch with me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm on andrewgold underscore OK and love hearing from you all. It's really touching. Next week is philosopher Julian Bagini. I'm reading his book, Life, a User's Manual. It's one of his many books on philosophy and is a great introduction to his work. It's very accessible and gives helpful advice about how to live our lives from the perspectives of the great philosophers. So I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. That's next week, and I'll see you then.